Welcome to the 79th AIOT and the first ever global symposium on complex and challenging cases. I think uh, Gaurav uh, has been such a big support. I must thank Dr. Gaurav, first of all, for you know helping me during this uh, whole conducting this or getting this together. And I definitely have to thank my panelists, uh, Dr. Rohit, Dr. Lahane, Dr. Partha, and I, I know he's not here yet, and Dr. Namrata, who without which, honestly, we're not going to have a great discussion without them. So, of course, we need them at all times during this event. Uh, and least, I mean, none but not the least, but these innovators, these absolute innovators, these absolute stunning stalwarts who I learned so much from personally. Along with that, I'm sure that there is so much of camaraderie between the room. And I'm thinking in the past four or five minutes, we've already seen that kind of uh, spill of information and uh, spread of uh, knowledge that's going around. Uh, but uh, put your seatbelts on and get ready because this session is going to be one after the other. Uh, they're going to be knocking it out of the park. So get ready. We're going to start off the session. But before that, I want to have a few words, uh, Gaurav, uh, before you say a few words. But we're going to start the session with Kevin Miller with a very special topic uh, with God of first few words. Yeah, thanks, Ashwin. I think uh, we have an amazing lineup, uh, the who's who of ophthalmology from across the world. So I think it's going to be very exciting. We have some very interesting topics as well. And I think, uh, you know, as Ashwin said, please tighten your seatbelts and let's get going. Um, we'll start with Kevin Miller. He's, uh, I would uh, actually read out his talk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Kevin will be talking to us uh, today about surgical anterior capsulotomy enlargement and first string pupilloplasty in a patient with persistent uh, midriasis following a multifocal IOL implantation. I know it's a long topic, but believe me, there's a lot more sense when Kevin talks, so and not when I talk. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Ashwin. Thank you, Joshua. So um, let's see. Get to here. There we go. Can everybody see uh, my screen? Full screen, yes. Yes, come on. All right. Yeah, so we have the problem um, often nowadays with premium IOLs. We have premium expectations and sometimes sub premium results. So I'm going to present a, uh, such a case that came to me um, just actually four weeks ago. So she was a 68 year old woman. Um, she had left eye cataract surgery uh, with another ophthalmologist. Uh, and at that time, a panoptics lens, 24 diopter uh, natural panoptics lens uh, was implanted. And then following surgery, she looked like the picture on the right. Um, she had a six millimeter dilated pupil. Um, you can see the opacified anterior capsule, the capsular exercise, a little small, a little bit displaced. And um, she had trials of bromonidine and pilocarpine that didn't help reduce the size of her pupil at all. <clears throat> and we don't really know why her pupil was blown. You know, I, I suspect she had a post-op pressure spike, but she didn't have any of the symptoms of that. And the records from the other doctor didn't indicate any high pressure. So we just don't know. Um, but she did complain of poor vision, photophobia, glare sensitivity, and she also had a negative dysphotopsia on top of all of it. And because of the lack of any um, history of high pressure, she actually went through a neuro neurological evaluation, even had an MRI scan by an off outside, off uh, outside neurologist that all of that was negative. Her uncorrected distance visual acuity was 2040, uh, as, as you see with that picture. Her corrected vision was 2030 plus three with a small refractive error. Posterior segment examination was unremarkable. So she had essentially two problems and they're shown here in the same picture. One, she has a quite enlarged pupil and secondly, she has a small capsular excess that's associated with an opacified peripheral anterior capsule. So, so how would you attack these problems? Because um, they're both contributing to her overall uh, qual poor quality vision. So clearly she needs additional surgery. We did a, a look at her endothelium and there was uh, 1,302 cells on the back of her left cornea, thought sufficient to go back inside her, her eye. And so we did. This is what she looked like on the operating table under the operating microscope. And you can imagine if that was you, um, the type of glare sensitivity and just visual disturbance that you would experience. So we decided to tackle both of the problems, do, the, do a capsulotomy enlargement uh, first, and then go and do a pupilloplasty secondarily. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the entire uh, video sped up to eight times. So you can see all the little mistakes I make along the way. Get the little button to clear. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> so 
So this is what we do, a paracentesis, viscoelastic injection. You need to get viscoelastic under the capsule. So I do that by using a 30 gauge needle. So that lifts the capsule. Now once I have space and I can take my cannula under there and visco dissect the capsule off. Okay. So you need scissors, you need a combination of scissors. Close that now for the other one, not this one. Yeah. Scissors and capsule rexus forceps. You can only tear so far and then you hit a wall and then you do a little more scissor work and you try to tear. Oftentimes this is what happens. It's very resistant to tear. Um, sometimes you get little stretches where you can tear it. Like I think I'm gonna hear it. Here's a stretch where I can actually tear the thing. Oftentimes you're peeling out um, subcapsular fibrosis at the same time. That's what I'm doing here. Uh, the oblig obligatory air injection. <laughs> um, and then I ended up, I couldn't finish it by tearing it. So I ended up just basically finishing off the thing by, uh, by, by cutting it. So again, we're using micro scissors, micro capsule excess forceps, but in the end, I was able to get a capsulotomy open that was about five millimeters in diameter. So part one done, and then we'll just clear out the viscoelastic here. So that's not sufficient though. She still has a very enlarged pupil. So on to part two. So here's a, a, I'm gonna show you, it's just a standard uh, suture pupiloplasty. Amar has become the uh, world's expert uh, on this whole uh, process. Um, I made two mistakes here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you my mistakes. Let's see if I can get the little video thing to show up. Oh, here we go, there we go. So another paracentesis. So I'm sitting superiorly here. I'm gonna pass my first needle in inferonasally and then we just kind of loop it around the pupil using the uh, micro graspers to feed the iris over this uh, CIF4 needle. This is a 10 -O proline. We'll dock it to a cannula and then come out. You, know, you, you need to dock to a cannula so you don't end up spearing the cornea and grabbing corneal fibers on the way out. So then we go back in the same spot and you know, loop around again and again and again, cannula in and then come out. And then I need to turn my uh, microscope so I'm sitting temporally. So I'm, uh, so I'm doing right now, I'm reordering the microscope. And then I'll continue going around clockwise. Now I'm going from suprotemporal to inferotemporal. Now I made the mistake of cutting off the other needle. I should have left this double arm. You're gonna see why in just a minute. Um, I was just gonna finish it off, just going in the direction that I'm going. But I am so clumsy with my left hand. Here I am, needle in my left hand. And I can't do this for the world. I just, it's just so awkward. Problem is I already cut off the other needle. <laughs> so what to do here? I'm fumbling, fumbling, I screw it, I can't do it. So finally, I just, I, I tied another needle on to the cut end and then I went back to sitting superiorly and then I made my second mistake. And you're gonna see it here. When I went in to the inferonasal incision, I, I snagged some cor corneal fibers right there didn't know it until after the needle was already in the eye and I looped the, the pupil margin. Now, fortunately, I didn't snag a lot of corneal fibers. And you'll see I, get, I can get out of this one. So we're gonna finish up by coming out the, the same paracentesis that we started in. And then I'm gonna pull on the, the proline suture. You're gonna watch the iris goes right up to the incision. So fortunately, it wasn't a lot. I grabbed it and yanked it with both sides and I was able to get it to uncatch. And then the next challenge is sizing the pupil. Now we're gonna tie this <clears throat> kind of like a mechanical um, uh, uh, suture uh, technique. So you end up kind of pulling the iris up to the incision and you hope when you tie the knot, you tie it at the right size, but you're not tying it centrally, you're tying it kind of eccentrically. So it's just kind of a lot of guesswork. And of course the pupil never looks perfectly round. It looks scalloped whenever you suture it like this. So you have to promise these patients you're not gonna have a round pupil at the end. Hopefully it'll be better than what you started off with. And then the last thing you don't want to do is you don't want to cut the knot here. So you have to be really careful to cut the suture ends and not the knot because then you start all over, which I didn't do that. You can see the iris atrophy. I'm pretty sure she had a pressure spike. So we're going to take out the viscoelastic now. Again, you've seen the entire operation because I've done the whole operation in front of you just at eight times normal speed. Hydrate the incisions, pressurize the eye. And at the very end, uh, you'll see me right, let's see right here, I inject some moxifloxacin. And that's the case. There's the moxifloxacin. So, so what did she look like afterwards? Well, here she is. Uh, left is pre-op and then right is post-op. This is two weeks post-op. 
And in retroillumination, here she is uh, before on the left and after on the right. You can see the, uh, the multifocal eye well is nicely centered and we don't have any uh, edge showing. So postoperatively, her glare symptoms were much improved. Her uncorrected distance visual acuity was still 2040, which is what it had been preoperatively. Her CDVA, her corrected distance visual acuity was 2025 now with a relatively small manifest refraction. Uh, but it's not over for her yet. Her, her, the next step in her care process will be a posterior capsulotomy with a laser. And if she's you know, chasing the dream of perfection um, and wants to be 2020 uncorrected, we may even do a little touch up post op of PRK with her at some point down the road. But that's where she is right now. So thank you for, uh, for letting me present, Ashwin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, that was simply wonderful. And the kind of expertise that you have, I didn't think that that was possible for me to do that first string suture. That was really, really neatly done. Even though you said there were a lot of snags, I didn't see those snags. I only watched the end of the case. It looks beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, we want to finish a few talks before we go into some panel discussion. So we'll uh, proceed ahead. And Gaurav, can you do the... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, wonderful talk. And uh, now we have the privilege of inviting uh, Dr. Chi Soon Fek. Uh, she's a dear friend and uh, she's almost like uh, one of our AIOS members over the last year that we've had webinars. I think she has attended not less than 20 of them. So our Indian audience would be very familiar with her. She's equally good with uveitis, with, uh, with uh, you know, crazy dangling cataracts. So she's going to be speaking on uh, overcome by capsular Hello, fibrosis. First of all, Okay, sorry, that, that started prematurely. So I pre-recorded this so that I'll stay on time. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Ashvin and Gaurav for inviting me to participate. And I'll be speaking on overcome by capsular fibrosis. These are my financial disclosures with no relevance to my talk today. Anterior capsule contracture syndrome is caused by centripetal fibrosis and contraction of the capsulorexis. It is more common when the capsulorexis is small and the zonules are weak. It occurs especially in eyes with pseudo-exfoliation, uveitis and retinitis pigmentosa. The patient should be managed when symptomatic and in mild cases, a YAG anterior capsulotomy can be done. For moderate cases, a femto or manual capsulotomy. How about the severe cases where the intraocular lens is decentered or tilted? This first case is a 26-year-old female with a past history of uveitis currently off treatment. She underwent uneventful left phacal mastication with intraocular lens and gonio for glaucoma, and she was referred at three months post-operatively when her vision dropped to 621. You can see on slit lamp photo that she has got severe capsular phimosis, and the UVM showed that the LL was tilted. At the time of surgery, you can see a really small opening in the capsule and we inject that with dispersive viscoelastic to distend the capsular bag and then grasping the anterior capsule with non-tooth microforceps and the fibrosis uh, beneath with tooth forceps. We then gradually tease the scar tissue away from the anterior capsule and you can see that what I do is not just tease it outwards, but also downwards. And this makes uh, the, the dissection much easier than if we were to just try to pull it forwards. And uh, we have to switch hands as we move around. But we are able to do this relatively completely, 360 degrees around. Once we have removed the fibrosis, you can see the capsule opening has enlarged now. And the folds are no longer so tense. After injecting in a dispersive viscoelastic, we inject a capsule tension ring. You need to be very careful there in case you have any resistance that you do not push in case you rupture the bag. The next important step is to enlarge the capsulorexis, which is easily done because the fibrosis is removed, except for this area here when I encounter fibrosis. I'm providing the counterforce as I complete the enlargement of the capsule opening. At this stage here, we have a reasonably centered LL and we can even go behind the LL to remove dispersive viscoelastic safely. And importantly, at the end, I inject intracameral dexamethasone that's preservative free to ensure she does not have post-op inflammation. At post-op month one, you can see she has got 6 to 12 vision restored and her posterior capsule is reasonably clear, although some stria is still seen. This is the second case where a 71-year-old female 
underwent left fecal muscation with trifocal toric intraocular lens and had persistent post-operative inflammation. She was referred for a dissented LL three months post-operatively and her vision had dropped to 618 and 10 and she also had mild cystoid macroedema. You can see again the severe capsular phimosis and the UVM showed that the RL was tilted and descented and the zonules were also dehesed in some areas. At the time of surgery, you can see that this capsule is really phimotic and in addition, the lens is rather unstable. We use hooks to support the lens and we see vitreous presenting where the zonules are deficient. We stain with 50% diluted trimcinone acetonide and do dissociated vitrectomy to clear the vitreous. And then we support the rest of the capsular bag as we begin to tease the fibrosis tissue from the anterior capsule, which uh, we're holding gingerly with non-tooth forceps and the scar tissue with capsulorexis forceps. And we switch hands when we move around and we do this very patiently as we go around 360 degrees. And you can see we're making progress here. And you can see the haptic being buckled forward by the severe fibrosis and areas where we cannot uh, make progress. We then cut the fibrosis to release it and we use more dispersive viscoelastic to uh, separate the anterior from posterior capsules that are held by adhesion. And then uh, this area here, you can see severe viprosis that extends from the anterior to posterior capsule, and that's where I stop. And I would rather truncate this fibrosis because uh, you do not want to compromise the posterior capsule. And uh, as we move around again, we remove all this fibrosis. You can see an uh, area here that I've actually ripped the anterior capsule appearing now. And because of that, I'm able to use a capsule tension ring. In this case, I'm, I'm going to use two capsule tension segments to support the capsule bag in order to spare this multifocal toric lens. I insert the CTS that has been preloaded with Cortex 7.0. And after creating Hoffman pockets and marking 1.75 mm posterior to the limbus, I use a suture snare, which I've created with 26 gauge needle uh, to extend a loop of the suture to uh, lasso the end of the suture to the fixation point through the Hoffman pocket. And this is done uh, easily on this um, side here, but for the opposite side, and you're going to see me uh, do this very, very carefully. And you can see that the rib is present here. And I'm just going to be so careful so that I don't extend that rib as I insert the capsule tension segment and uh, repeat the procedure that you saw. And now I'm retrieving the sutures from the Hoffman pocket. And then we do a 2 one, one knot. So after the two throws, uh, we gently uh, adjust the sutures to support the lens and ensure it is centered before we finalize it with two more throws. Um, and then the knot is placed in the Hoffman pocket. So this patient one month post-operatively was able to see 6.5 and 5. And you can see that on UBM, the lens has been restored to anatomical position and is well centered. So in conclusion, severe cases of capsular phimosis require surgical management. Peeling of the scar tissue from under the anterior capsule can be achieved. A small CCC should be enlarged and a CTR should be inserted where possible. Intracameral dexamethasone and control of post-operative inflammation are important and RL centration and stability can then be restored. Thank you very much. That was uh, remarkable, uh, Dr. Chi. It was uh, just uh, so brilliant. You know, you have to kind of hold your breath and keep watching how you remove that fibrotic tissue from under the capsule. So I think uh, since we're going to have the discussion later, I'm sure we'll have lots of things to discuss. I'll request uh, Ashwin to go on and yes. please invite our next brilliant speaker. I think our next speaker is going to be Sergio Canabrava, but unfortunately he has a uh, theater right now. He has uh, his OR going on in, his, in Brazil. So I'm going to be... Uh, playing his video, he has sent me his presentation, and here goes. So this is for his Canabrava ring. I hope everybody can see my screen. Hello, guys. It's a pleasure to to be here to talk for the All India Ophthalmology Society. Uh, I'm not live because it's Friday morning in Brazil. I am in my day surgery and the operating room now. 
and I will try to, to go online for the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Ashvin, bro, to the invitation. Uh, here my disclosure about this, this talk. And I'd like to start uh, with this question. Uh, some Sergio asked me, Sergio, there are a lot of rings in the market. Why do you try to create a new ring? When I start uh, in my, in, uh, like a preceptor, like a staff in the public hospital in my city in Brazil, and uh, the price of the, the all cataract surgery for the surgeon, for the uh, anesthetic, for the IOL, for everything is $100. Yes, is you are in a developing country. In all expansion rings in Brazil, the price is about 120 then the expansion rings in Brazil is most expensive than the price of the all contract. Then I was talking how I, I can solve it. And in 2015, 2014, I was in the in the sofa uh, watching a, a TV show and uh, have this this video that starting research with 3D printer, uh, which uh, using in neurologic surgery and the orthopedic is. Then I have the idea, oh my God, I can do a, a, a intraocular device, an expansion ring with a 3D printer. Absurd, my, my five first uh, uh, designs, and I like to say, don't, uh, it, it's difficult to, 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 to give in the, to, to have the final design. Look, I, I, this, this ring is my first Canaveral rings. Okay, then I produce the first ring. You can see this video in the 3D printer. It's impossible to, to work it. It's about in 2014 and trying a, a, a pig pig's eye. Uh, here, the first model that works uh, are in PubMed. It was the first uh, ophthalmologic device, intraocular device producing the 3D, 3D printer that works. Sometimes don't know about it, but the camera rings was this. And when the game charger uh, in ACIS Barcelona 2015, when I received this prize in the ACIS Film Festival, and the uh, AJL, AJL from Spain came to me and said, I like your ring. You would like to, to produce it in, in, in our company? Yes, of course, why not? But it was not my, my first goal. Then, uh, you start with this design, this design too, and this final design that you can see. And here, the final design of the ring. Uh, you can see uh, it's the first ring in the market that there is no like a hook uh, like this this design. You are alternate alternate parts. Uh, the small parts, they're not uh, uh, above. This big part that go above the eyes and they're not uh, under this, this part. And you have two hooks to stabilization because in, you receive this prize in ACIS with the best paper of the section. And it is important about the ring. And then my suggestion with uh, other rings too. Uh, it's at the position because if you see here, the large ident needs to be above the iris. Uh, I like to, to say start with uh, 3.5 to 4 millimeters because it's not easy to start the technique of the Canaveral ring. And why to why it's bigger than 11 millimeters? Uh, the competitor in the market, uh, uh, as I, I told you, there are a lot of rings in the market, amazing rings. For example, Dr. Boris, I love, I'm fan of Dr. Dr. Boris Maliugi. Uh, but what's the difference of the Canaveral ring? Is the, the more thin in the market, only 0.4 millimeter in vertical five. There are other rings, I ring, Oasis, Morsh, Maliugi, there's a, a about uh, 0.7 to 0.9 millimeters. Uh, because this, uh, one of the, this point I, I call my ring of the shelling ring is really uh, it's not easy to start the technique. Uh, the surgeon needs to be uh, experienced in, I don't suggest it for beginners, uh, but when you, you, you demand the technique, you can do a lot of challenge case like this one. You can see a, pa a patient with, uh, I like to do a blue bubble technique that I have described. It. Uh, you do a one millimeter incision, go with a cannula, and you go behind the iris, you inject the, the, the blue, the dripping blue behind the iris. 
then after you, uh, after you insert, you can insert the ring. Observe, the ring works like, and you can connect, and all capsule will, will uh, uh, think, uh, print with the, the third fibro blue. And you observe how the ring solves this, this problem. Here, another surgery that you can see. There's no uh, pupil here. And I like to do a, a small cut with a micro scissor. And you can see, and then the ring works, and I connect the small indentation behind the eyes, and the large indentation will be uh, above the eyes. Uh, here, you can see how the ring can stable in a, a patient with scleral fixation. You can see I'm connecting the small indentation. And again, the right side of the small indentation. And then finally, I connect the, the rook stabilization behind the iris. And the ring stays so, so thin in the anterior chamber because it's about the middle of the size of the height size of the uh, other rings in the eye, in the, in the, in the market. Here, I'm doing an IMN technique. Uh, you can see uh, the ring stays stable during all the, the surgery. Then uh, the trailing haptic of the Yaman technique. And here I removing the first the first haptic. Then I remove the other haptic. And you can see how the the IOL stays stable. So after to insert the flesh inside the eye, I remove the the, the capsule and then I remove the kind of rubber ring, and then you can see uh, this part is easy to do. Okay, then I suggest you observe this patient, observe, no anterior chamber. Then in this kind of patient, you can see I'm, I'm trying to, to insert the, the trip and blue behind the eyes, like I told you, the, the blue bubble technique, as you can see. But I like to do a, a anterior vitrectomy to decrease the depression. The, the and after to, to decrease the pressure, how the, the ring is so thin, I start the, the I insert the ring in the iris, and then you can see how it's and my question it's possible to use no visco during the phantom. Yes, uh, I, I think without suture, okay. I think only the Canberra ring and the BX from my friend uh, Suven. Uh, Suven, I didn't put your ring in the market because you don't have BX here in Brazil. Sorry, bro, but you don't have here in Brazil. Uh, then here you can see uh, a, a patient that uh, you do a, a, a fento. You insert in the 1.4 millimeter incision. Then I move the visco. Uh, here, the ring uh, is ins inside the, the, the catalyst, and then you can see how the patient can go uh, walking and back to the operator room. Uh, here, I'm finishing, I'm removing the, the capsule hex and inserting a, a CTR, because you can see there is a disinsertion in the, in the inferior part, and then after the fake emulsification, I remove and insert the IOL, I remove the, the, the kind of ring, and it moves the ring from the eye. It's only 0.4 millimeter. And then here I'm doing the, the eye the dialysis. Also, as you can do, this is a, a double flange, a kind of brava technique here, like we'll describe for uh, other surgery. Yes, but I, I like to, I prefer to, to use a, uh, a point of plan 10 zero. Here are the final results. Uh, uh, okay, thank you for the invitation. Here my Instagram. Uh, I have surgeries every week uh, for share. Thank you. And that was uh, Sergio's Canabrava ring and all its indications. Thank you, Sergio. Gaurav, can we, we'll move on to the next speaker. Yeah, sure. So I think that's really interesting. And we have the other master of small pupils here as well, uh, Boris, and uh, we'll have fun time, uh, you know, uh, listening to him as well. But first, uh, Dr. Priya Narin, a dear friend, 
and a brilliant uh, surgeon. She's uh, innovated so many techniques and uh, uh, she has done pioneering work with the Advanced Vision Analyzer, which recently also uh, got recognition by a very good publication. So I think uh, it'll be really nice to hear. I've had my hands on the Advanced Vision Analyzer as well and really enjoyed it. So Priya, please go ahead. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, AIOS and uh, Ashwin and Dr. Kauro for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, uh, I really feel honored to be here, especially when I have uh, Dr. Kevin with me. So I really feel good about it. So uh, let us go ahead and I'll be presenting uh, the uh, newer uh, device, which is uh, the Advanced Vision Analyzer. It's a virtual reality automated perimeter. It's a US FDA approved device. So um, uh, I'm going to give uh, a brief overview of what this actually this new innovation is all about. And we have this uh, peer review paper coming up very soon in one of the flagship journals of the American Academy. Uh, the advanced vision analyzer, uh, this is the device. This is how it looks like. It has four major parts. Uh, that's the head mounted device. It has a patient response button, the test control device, and it has a backend server, which serves as a cloud. So this is uh, um, the video which uh, just shows how this uh, device actually is. Uh, this is the head mounted device. This is what the patient actually wears. Uh, it's a headband and it has an adjustable knob on it so that uh, it can fix up. It, it is attached to the patient response button wherein the patient clicks the button when the patient sees the stimulus. And then this is the test control device uh, wherein uh, all the data of the patient uh, and uh, the test strategy and the algorithm, everything is uh, uh, fed into it. And it also has an eye tracking system, you know, uh, that helps to track the movement of the eye. You can adjust the uh, intergrupulary distance uh, also uh, on this device. And you can also uh, correct the refractive error and then perform uh, the visual field test in this patient. So uh, basically this device, it has uh, the programs and strategies that have been fed are the 30-2, the 24-2 and the 10-2 program and the algorithms are the, uh, there are these algorithms are specifically designed for this device. Uh, they are the, uh, the fast algorithm, which is a spray, uh, screening uh, method, which uh, I think we all are used to using uh, the Humphrey. So ELISA fast uh, corresponds to the uh, CETA fast program, which is there on a Humphrey, the ELISA standard, this corresponds to the CETA standard. And then there's also a full threshold program. So it uh, actually offers um, all the details and all the uh, threshold programs, which all the ophthalmologists are actually used to using it. And uh, the important key features of this device is that, you know, it offers the white on white perimetry. And as, as I said before, there is a lens holder, there's an eye tracking subsystem, there is the stimuli are presented at the Goldman size three as uh, in other devices. Uh, there are cache trials uh, which are fed into this device and it keeps on checking for uh, false negative and uh, positives and fixation losses. There is uh, uh, the cloud-based uh, based storage system. That's uh, uh, one of the major advantage of this device. You know, uh, you can back up all the test reports, uh, etc., all the information and you can retrieve it as and when needed. Uh, and, and this device, actually, it has its own normative database and uh, uh, the device, it has been checked uh, before performing the visual field uh, test and coming into the market. Uh, we decided on uh, doing the assessment of the blind spot location. These are the basics that a, uh, basics that a device should go through uh, before it gets validated. And the test retest variability of the device is also perfect. It is bang on. Uh, it has been checked. This is how the visual field reports. I'm just giving a brief overview. Uh, uh, this is how the visual field uh, reported actually looks like on an AVA. And on the right, you see what you see in the Humphrey. So this is basically uh, 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 quite, we are quite acquainted to interpreting these kind of visual field reports. Uh, the point wise sensitivity that we have done a basic uh, calc, uh, uh, the uh, basic analysis of uh, patients, of normal patients and glaucoma patients also, and we have compared the point wise sensitivity values also uh, uh, in all the age group of the patients. And uh, that, that, that was a major study that we did on these cases. And you know, there's an uh, uh, excellent correlation uh, between uh, both the devices and because actually we were uh, just trying to see that how good we stand when we compare it with the Humphrey because that's, that, 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 that's the device which is uh, commonly used by almost all the um, uh, ophthalmologists globally. So uh, I think EVA stands a very good chance because uh, uh, the point by sensitivity values, they quite correlate very well. 
uh, this is the correlation coefficient for both the devices when it was compared. Uh, this, this is actually a 24-2 test, which was done at 54 uh, threshold points uh, on the visual field were analyzed. So this is how the uh, bland element plot and the regression analysis, what you see on the right side, it shows the correlation for the mean sensitivity values for both the devices. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the uh, mean deviation and the pattern standard deviation, uh, accident correlation again. Uh, which is C. Uh, the only thing that we are coming up now is, which I think every device needs to undergo and uh, uh, through the uh, development, which happens gradually. And that is what we are trying to do is uh, to uh, get into the progression analysis and the EMR integration for this device. Uh, the advantages that I would say with this device are that uh, it, uh, it's portable. So now that's the major advantage. You can do the test of patient in any position that is comfortable to the patient. Uh, there is no learning curve. It's absolutely simple to use. You do not need a designated field, uh, a designated place to sit and do this. Uh, wherever you can even do the test at patient's home. If, this, if the patient cannot come to the clinic, it can be done and the reports can be easily shared with the ophthalmologist and you know, treatment can be initiated for the patient. Uh, it is cost effective, almost it is one fourth the cost of what a normal uh, goal perimeter costs. Uh, it's very helpful in rural areas because you can, uh, especially on, uh, in the developing countries and even the developed countries, it would work very well because, you know, uh, it gives a lot of freedom. People might not be able to come from rural areas, so you can do that and you can offer high-end treatment to your patients. As I said before, it allows postural freedom, patients with spinal deformities and uh, other postural deformities who are not in a position to sit for quite some long time, they, they can perform the test even in the supine position. And especially the uh, another most important advantage that we have in the post-COVID situation is that, you know, the patient can wear the face mask and then the patient can do the perimetric test, which is actually not possible to do on a bowl perimeter. And, you know, you can make even make the patient sit in another room. You can, uh, you can uh, keep quite a bit of... Um, uh, physical distance from the patient and you can do this test. So that's one of the major advantages uh, that come up uh, with this device. So this is uh, a brief overview of what we actually have with this device. And um, yeah, so that's the information that I actually wanted to pass on to everybody. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, Priya. That was brilliant and very, very concisely put forward in terms of all the advantages and all the points that were that are you know talk, doing the rounds in terms of all portable devices that are coming into the future, especially the post-COVID era. Uh, I think this is uh, an exceptional product in its own way. Um, I, I will definitely move on to the next speaker uh, is going to be Boris. And after that, uh, seatbelts on because they're going to be a round of five minutes of Q&A. Uh, so yes, Boris, kick it off with your topic on constructing pupil management strategies. Boris, are you here? I saw him. He there. was there, yeah. He was there. I think he's having a slight uh, technical glitch in his laptop. His internet is bad. Can I have... Uh... Should we... I see Boris still there. Uh... Yeah, he is not having he internet. I think we should go for the uh, he is there, he is there, he is speaking. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I'm back. Sorry, sorry for that. Um we'll be happy to uh to talk on the topic of uh, constricting people. Basically uh it's one of the issues that may happen during cataract surgery and uh, of course uh, uh, small pupils were initially dissipated Boris we don't see your screen yet are you going to share the screen I think we lost him he's dropped out yeah, yeah so I think some issues with the Let's wait for 30 seconds. Do you want to start the discussion now, Ashwin? Or? Yeah, I think we can do that. We can move move to the discussion. Uh, can we have uh, Rohit? Yes, hi, Dr. Rohit. And Dr. Lahane, Dr. Namrata, I'm sure she's here somewhere. She'll come back. 
Uh, Boris has joined back. Let's see if he can uh, upload his. So welcome back, Boris. Can you uh, share screen and uh, try to start again? Yes. Uh, so once again, it looks like internet connection is not very good. However, I will try uh, to continue my talk. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the idea here was to uh, say that uh, it dissipates more people. It's so one piece because they really feel prepared and will build changes to do that. However, if you are having this type of case when the people goes uh, more or less uh, wide, the uh, I think uh, oh, maybe yeah. he can mail us his presentation and then just speak and we can upload it or something. Yeah, we'll so, tell him. I'll, I'll tell him that. So I think we had a great uh, session so far and, uh, you know, we've seen some amazing uh, videos uh, starting with uh, Kevin's uh, wonderful video. And I was, uh, you know, so keen to ask because in India, we tend to use uh, Dr. Amar's, uh, and I'm sure you're expecting this question, Kevin, uh, because uh, we do a lot of uh, single pass for through pupil plasty. It seems to work uh, nicely in our hands. Yes, your pupil looks so much more beautiful because it's nice and round. Uh, but, you know, for, a, for an average surgeon, I think uh, we found the single pass for through pretty nice. So any particular reason why you prefer that? And then we'll have, ask the panelists uh, what they would like to say. Well, by doing a, a 360 pupiloplasty, you can titrate the pupil size. Um, if, you're, if you're doing the four pass, you know, single throw four pass, then you're basically nodding down the pupil in locations, but then uh, it tends to bunch up more and you have a harder time centering the pupil exactly where you want it. This is again, this is a multifocal case where it's really critical that that entire central ring of the multifocal be, be, be contained in the, in, the, um, in the pupil itself. So I think uh, there's simplicity in a Mars technique and that's the beauty of it. Um, but the, the, the ability to adjust isn't quite there. So you know, if you wanna have a better adjustment capability then you, you have to spend a little more time going all the way around in this fashion. The more bites you take, also the better the pupil is going to look. If you just try to take a couple of bites, it's going to be very scalloped. I agree with uh, many of those points. And yes, uh, maybe we should ask uh, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash, uh, who's one of our panelists, and he does some extraordinary surgery too. I, I think it was uh, perfectly uh, executed. They say horses for courses. And uh, this pupiloplasty was appropriate, aptly done because of the type of intraocular lens the patient had and the type of expectation she had. So I think for this particular condition, uh, this technique uh, would have done better than, uh, you know, our, our technique. <laughs> when I say our <laughs> technique. <laughs> uh, I know, we we all consider it as our technique. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, I, uh, I perfectly agree with Dr. Kevin because uh, what he said uh, was a very important point. I don't know uh, because uh, I know when I first started doing the first train, uh, you need to take smaller bites because uh, 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 when I started my first case, when I did, you know, my bites were not very close. So when they are not very close, you know, you, you can see those string of that suture going through there Absolutely. and you, you, you don't get it so beautifully round. So yeah, that was a very important point. When you're doing a first string, you have to do it very close. That's like, you know, just stitching something and then close stitches kind of thing. So then it works perfectly fine. You get a good round shape. The best thing is they can titrate it according to yes. the, that's the best part. Uh, yeah. Is there any specific thing like uh, Dr. Kevin, I want to ask you, like you have a multifocal and then you are trying to uh, put it all around it. Uh, uh, usually we have uh, those rings coming up. So is there a uh, pro, uh, appropriate sizing that you would consider to have in this because you can titrate uh, the amount of uh, tightness or the tautness that you have that you need? Well, I have a lot of experience with artificial iris devices, especially the human optics device. And, and we there use a 3.35 millimeter uh, pupil. And, and I found uh, over the years I've been doing it, that that's a really an adequate pupil size. It gives a good compromise between being able to visualize the fundus and yet not having it so large that it compromises the acuity. So, you know, I, I, I don't stick a ruler in the eye and titrate it down to 3.35 millimeters. But, you know, mentally, I'm thinking that's about the size I would like. Do you see the size of the pupil on the other side also? Uh, to just uh, um, the patient's under drape, so um, no, I don't. Preoperatively, so that you know. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually they've been given some narcotics and stuff. So, you know, oftentimes the other pupil is like pinpoint. So you really can't adjust it to that size or you don't want to. Right. I had a question for Dr. Chi and uh, Dr. Chi, I know I've used your bimanual technique of holding and uh, pulling on the capsule. Has it ever happened that, uh, you know, in these areas of fibrosis, there are areas of fibrosis and then not. Uh, so you're basically maneuvering around this uh, uh, strength and no strength. Has it ever happened that when you're doing this, it kind of rips uh, all the way to the periphery and it can it happen to me? So I'm just trying to ask, what are the tips and tricks that you can tell to kind of tone that down? Yeah, so in the second case, I showed that it was so tenacious that when I actually did the same maneuver, 360 degrees, there was one that extended. But because the fibrosis was so severe, it even extended to the periphery. So the end of this rip actually ended in the fibrosis. Ah, okay. And because of that, it doesn't rip right around. It doesn't go yeah. around. Mm. But it's sometimes you just have to feel it. And in the first patient, it gave very easily. The planes was very clear and I, you know, and very often it's hard to start actually. You don't know where to pick. And so what I do is I pick the area where you have lots of anterior capsule folds that you can see the wrinkling. And that's when it's elevated. So because it's scalloped and elevated, that's when you can grasp with the non-tooth forceps. And then you peel from below. And then that's how you start the plane and then you extend the plane. It's quite fun really. These cases demonstrate nicely the, um, the value of doing anterior capsule polishing. So I'll tell you, if you, if you polish the anterior capsule, you, you will never see one of these fibrotic you know, anterior capsules where it's all ring contracted down to you know, one millimeter or less. Um, and, and, and especially for Lusagno cases, the pseudoexfoliations, the ones that have trauma, the kids, you have to polish the anterior capsule. And ever since I started doing that 20 years ago, I've never seen one of these cases in my own practice. Another thing which I may add is that uh, what is the indication? I think we can use flax also for this purpose, like in the first case. That could have also helped. And then uh, YAG laser radial fold, radial cuts, can help if it is not in a very advanced stage. Well, if uh, your UBM shows that it is tilted, then you know uh, you can give it a trial. But my concern is that flax can also help you in, uh, in like in the first case, in sorting out, uh, uh, you know, you, you, it makes life easier for you. Flax is good if you're willing to sacrifice the lens, but you will, you will damage the lens. So it's good for a lens exchange situation, but not good if you're leaving the lens in the eye. Yeah, yeah and also when you cut the capsule, you know, you can see after I peeled off the fibrosis, actually the capsule is just expanded. So when you cut, with a femto capsulotomy, you know, you could have a very wide rexus. And I don't know whether it's going to be evenly round. And because I want to insert a CTR, you know, uh, still use that lens, especially in the multifocal toric, you can see how bent that, you know, plate haptic lens was. So once you cut, actually, you know, it will be so big that I might not be able to fixate this lens. And YAG laser relaxing incisions are very, very, very unfulfilling. <laughs> <laughs> You blast away and you get a half a millimeter, you know, increased diameter. It's just very, very, uh, you end up with a bunch of little cuts and, and no benefit. Yeah, but in my experience, you know, what I have been doing, because in this part of the country, we really do have lots of uh, pseudo exfoliation syndrome patients. And they do have anterior capsular contraction. So, uh, you know, I just give radial cuts and, uh, you know, uh, I have no doubt I have not done UBM, not gone into detailing but patients are visually very happy with that. If it is not in a very advanced stage. You have to do them early, but better than that is, is polish the capsule. Then you won't have to do no, any of this. That goes without saying, yeah, interior capsule polishing. We can ask Lahane sir for his pearls for uh, pseudo exfoliation yeah. and how to prevent such capsular phimosis. Sir, you have so much experience, uh, please share with us. Now, uh, see, in the pseudo exfoliation, when we operate, so you uh, know the zonals are very, very weak. And uh, in such zonules, it is a, whenever we are operating, the first thing is that rexis is not possible. And what uh, Professor uh, uh, C was doing, that we'll have to support it, uh, means we'll have to support the capsule also, and then uh, both sides support. Then only we can go ahead. 
if it is not much you can say the zonules are not much weak then it is possible but sometimes what happens it goes in the periphery and uh, it is very difficult to operate secondly after doing nexus also if you are doing the peco then in that i zonules are weak the uh, there may be a subluxation or dislocation the lens may go behind so before that we will have to put the ctr ring and after putting the ctr ring then you can uh, i think uh, you can go for the um, peco emulsification Thank you, sir. Thanks for those questions. Can I, I think, ask? I think Sergio, there, Ashwini, would you like to ask Sergio? He's joining us. Sergio, uh, Sergio, Sergio just ask him one question, and I think uh, when is it coming to our part of the world, uh, Sergio? We all want to know. When is the Canabrava ring coming here? <laughs> Hello, Ashwini. Thank, Thank you, my friend. Sorry to to not be uh, live. Uh, uh, I'm in the operating room now. I, I go out a few minutes to, to discuss for this important meeting. I don't know India. I, I believe if we, uh, Ashwin Company can uh, import it for <laughs> India, it will be my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a brilliant video and we really look forward to laying our hands onto your ring. And, uh, you know, as much as we enjoy Boris's ring uh, and we would love to try out your ring as well. And thanks for sending that really nice video. Any other questions, Ashwin? Uh, and, and I like I like to say Boris is the master. Uh, I, have, I have only uh, uh, okay. I have one question, Sergio. What are the difficulties even now that you face with your ring, and what are the contraindications that you would not use your ring in those particular scenarios? Are there any? I I, I don't suggest to to insert the ring in in eyes with uh, white to white, uh, uh, less than uh, is small is smaller than uh, eleven millimeter the white to white diameter. Uh, because the the small 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 eyes, you have a, a problem, a difficult to insert the ring in the eyes. Right. Okay. Uh, does it work on hard rock brown cataracts? I mean, do they come out? Because in case you're doing a small incision or uh, or sorts, does it come out? Is it expandable? No, no. After after you connect in the eyes, it's so stable because the technology is like a wave. Uh, the eyes stay in the in the ring like a wave. It's so thin, as you 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 saw in the video, has mm. only 0.4 millimeters in 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 the in the height diameter. I think only BX for my friend the seven is smaller in in height diameter. And then is after to to connect the eyes is is amazing. But I like to say it's really difficult to to get the the, the 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 technique then i don't suggest to start the ring for for beginners is a, a ring that you need to be more experienced uh oasis i ring is easier to to start with the the technique with a uh, small expansion ring got it thank you sergio thanks for that and we need to move on with the program as well so gaurav uh, i know dr jord is uh, not here yet but let's move on to uh, dr amar who's after jord mehta yeah, I'll take that privilege of inviting uh, Dr. Amar, who's again been a guide and a mentor, and uh, he's uh, you know taught us so many things that um, you know I, from my time I started my career way back in '97, '98. I've been learning and learning and learning, and today I continue to learn. So, uh, Dr. Amar sir uh, is going to speak on mastering pinhole pupilloplasty, uh, which is one of the innovations that he's uh, made, and amongst so many of them. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Gaurav, Ashwin, and all of you there. So I'll just play this video first and I hope it's playing there. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes, thank okay. you. So let's understand this point here in this particular case. This is perhaps an oops surgery, which I have done, but there is some learning we can manage from this particular case. Now look at this case here. This was a case which had keratoconus. Penetrating keratoplasty was done. Look at the astigmatism. is about 13 diopters of astigmatism. The pinhole pupillasty was done by us. And a mistake I have done is, look at my Purkinje image. It is not centered. The second mistake which I had done was, somewhere mistake was done in the IOL power calculation. And because of that, this patient had a mismatch, bad mismatch, and the vision was about counting figure. So now what we had to do is, I had to go in, 
first of all undo the pinhole pupilloplasty the second thing which we had to do was we had to also remove this iul and exchange it now you can see the mistakes there are two here basically as i had done one is a decentered pinhole pupil which is very stupid of me the second was the iul power calculation now remember this is a penetrating keratoplasty i already so we have to be very very careful that the endothelium does not get damaged once we have cut off those sutures now we are trying to see can i take this iul out we are worried whether a pc rupture can occur or not so we prepared flap just in case a runt occurs but now we made a scleral tunnel insertion and you can see carefully remove this iul now we are going to put the correct power iul back inside the capsule was intact so we have comparatively safer here now you can see that lens going into the sulcus it's a three piece iul so we are very safe wherever it goes it does not matter as long as it's a three piece iul now once this is done now we go ahead and do the single pass four throw pupillary you can do any technique for pinhole but we find this the easiest and i have to also thank priya narang for this uh, work the pioneering work she has done on the four throw pupillary once you have done this again i'm making the pupil smaller if the pupil becomes too small watch what i'm doing i'm using the vitrectomy probe to see that the pupil becomes exactly bang centered with the perkins image that is a key missed point but again made a mistake here and that is the pupil is too large so now once we have created this other problem post operatively day 1 patient improved to 660 but on the anterior segment oct we saw the patient having a 3.5 mm pupil now 13 day after the astigmatism is there so now what do we do to solve this problem now at that time we started discussing with jack holiday and with the help of jack holiday we devised this device which is the pinhole device of holiday with epsilon and you can see there are different hole sizes there all you do is put it in front of the patient pre operatively and see which pupil he likes some patients might like 2 mm some might like 1 mm please remember previously i used to make everyone 1.5 to 2 the patients are all happy but can i fine tune it better now once you have done pre operatively in this particular patient we found the patient was very happy with 1 mm so we said let's go back inside and do it now the question is can i make it 1 mm and accurately do it so what you need to do is take out the reticule the eye piece and change it to a reticular eye piece this is the reticular eye piece which is available and if you see the markings there it shows how much is 1 mm so all you do is in one eye you will see the reticule there so now what you do is take the patient back to the or now remind you this is the third time i have taken the patient back now you can see i'm doing the single pass photopiplasty and on the photopiplasty remember you need a paracentesis on one side only where you are bringing it out the other side does not need a paracentesis so it's very easy bring this loop out once the loop comes out all you have to do is this is the single pass remember the number 4 pass it four times and that is game set and match you don't need to do second pass you don't need to do three to two throws all you need to do is this and you can do this in any technique even as kevin showed his purse string suture if you do the fourth throw with the purse string it will not open up again so you need not go in again and again to do the knot now once you have done this remember my target is to make it 1 mm and i'm using the reticule also of the eye piece to help it now i made it too small once it becomes too small all you need to do is have fluid in the eye through a trocar acm or an acm and just use the vitrectomy probe to see that your bang approximately 1 mm what am i trying to tell everyone here is we can now fine tune this game patients are happy after pinhole can i improve it by one line or two lines and answer is yes now look at the perkins image it is bang centered not only is bang centered i made it 1 mm from a 3.5 to 1 mm the question comes how did the patient behave so let's see this patient now patient improved to 612 remember the patient now has got previously counting finger 1 meter look at the astigmatism it was 13 diopters we did an iul exchange 
made a mistake of the pinhole being 3.5 mm vision had improved to 660 finally we knocked it down with the jack holiday pinhole device from made by epsilon and then we used the eyepiece using the reticule marker to see that we can fine tune it so that on table we can get that pupil exactly what we desire so the moral of what i'm trying to tell everyone is when you see a patient who has got high aberrated corneas and astigmatism crazy astigmatism all you do is use the pinhole device check what is the pupil which is best for the patient every patient will not be liking a 2 mm pupil so what you do is decide what patient pupil likes and then go ahead make the pupil of that particular size and once you do that you will see patients even more happy than what they were before thank you very much i'd like to thank namrata sharma for doing such a fantastic conference and everyone in the panel also thank you very much thank you uh, dr amara thank you for that uh, i think this has been a exceptional topic and it's changed the whole game in terms of how iris surgery can actually help refractive patients um moving on to our next speaker i think uh, uh, very very uh, renowned speaker renowned surgeon uh, dr john chang he's been the past president of isrs and uh, has been such a beautiful friend and wonderful friend to me as well uh, so john all yours screen is all yours yeah you have my screen there absolutely okay well it's always indeed a great honor to be invited I'd like to thank you ashwin and gora for your invitation um very honored to be speaking among such great speakers i'm going to show a video uh, actually uh instead just to save time i'm going to switch location now to the cornea and i'm going to share with you how to do femto laser cut in very small eyes and see whether we can do it even without suction i have no financial interest related to this presentation in small eyes it is very difficult to apply suction even after lateral canthotomy in microkeratome you never cut the flap if you don't have proper suction but if we cannot get proper suction can we perform a femto flap cut well let's see This is a first case a 44 year old lady who's only 5 feet tall very small palpebral fissures she's a moderate to high myope she has presbyopia of plus 1.0 we plan the way for an optimize in the right eye and custom Q treatment in the left aiming for minus 1 for mono vision Her eyes very small and I couldn't get it in improperly even with a lot of hard pushing and couldn't get proper suction I'm checking the lid margins making sure the ring the lip of the suction ring is under the lids this is my first case and the patient's moving all over the place as you can see so i asked her not to move i i apply a little bit more pressure down see if i can get suction i couldn't and it looked okay according to the yellow ring on the screen uh which plans your laser cut but as you see the patient was moving while i performed the laser cut and obviously a vgb occurred as well and nothing could be done i didn't do the side cut if you don't do the side cut you've not created a flap you've really just done a lamella cut okay and as i said the cut was done without suction and the vgb obviously stopped me from uh going on and we immediately did lasik with mmc with the left eye and let's take a look at the results at 1 month the patient has recovered now to 2020 best corrected and it does take that long even with normal eyes when you do lasik and at 1 year she's 2015 best corrected in an eye and little under corrected uh but she's 2020 in both eyes and j1 and the patient is happy This is a second case again a small lady 5 feet tall 
uh, 35 years old, plan weight and optimize, moderate myo with LASIK plan. And now I have more experience. And if you look at this, um, I'm putting in the ring and I actually tried it to see if I can do it, but it just wasn't sitting properly. So I use the Q-tip and I check. You can see that the lashes and the lid was over the lip. And this one, you can see the suction lip right here is above the lashes. So I roll the lids out, roll it out, and I slip the lip under and I check the meniscus right here. You can see there's still a little bubble right here. So I'm not getting really proper suction. Right here you can see it is still, the meniscus is here, but there's still some bubble right here. So I'm not getting a proper contact. Here we are again. So I thought I had good suction. I'm applying the cone down, okay, and didn't work, okay, I lost suction. So I did it again, okay, this time I'm pushing down on the eye with my hands, uh, with, on the ring to keep the pressure down while I'm applying the cone. So I'm making sure I don't lose suction, but again, I lost suction. You can see the eyes moving all over the place. Here I got the patient stable. I, I actually paused for a while. This is speeded up. And um, I kept the patient um, not moving. And I did the cut. And after the cut, I still made sure the patient wasn't moving. Then I continued on with the side cut. So you can pause and take another look before you do the side cut. If you've not done the side cut, you basically have not made a flat. So we tried, as I mentioned, suction, keep breaking. So I maintain a constant pressure on the suction handle and then instruct the patient not to move his or her eyes and head. And as you can see, the stromal bed is nice and smooth after lifting the flat. Post-op one day, 20-20 vision in both eyes. So, can we perform femto cut without suction? What if the patient moves? Well, in microcurtome you have a free cut, but in this you don't. Especially if you haven't made the side cut. And even if you cut to the surface, the flat has not been dissected, so it's not going to move. Uh, the only potential problem is if the cut approaches the surface, while it's bisecting the visual axis. Well, the cut is so fine, it is, it is unlikely to cause any scarring or visual loss. And it does take a few seconds to reach the surface. They should have more than enough time for the surgeon to stop the, the laser. So interlace can be done without suction. Make sure the patient's eye don't move. Uh, pause a few seconds just to check the patient hasn't moved at all before you start the cut. And there is a problem. If the eye move, the patient just moves his head or her head, then you can just stop and don't perform the side cut. Use the same cone, recut at the same depth, or go to 40 micron deeper or shallower. Convert to a microcurtome if no side cut is performed. Or you could do LASIK with MMC as we did with the first case. And for very small eyes, perform a canthotomy. Do not use a lid speculum. You roll the eyelid outwards and slide the lip of the suction ring under the lid with a cotton tip applicator. Thank you. Sorry about the sound. <laughs> but with the, I just have one thing to add. With very small lids, it's so tight, you cannot even get the Q-tip to kind of to move the eyelid because you got to move like this. So the best thing is put it there and you just roll the eyelid. You use you know use the Q-tip to roll the eyelid. The nice thing is when you roll it, it actually everts the lid and lifts it. You can go under, put the lip under the lid. So that's that one little trick for um for getting the uh, interlace the the lip under the lid uh, uh, that I acquired. I find that very helpful.
I think that's extremely uh, beneficial. And I think there's so many other advantages to knowing that simple knowledge, even in cataract surgery, even if you want to put a speculum in or so many other aspects to it. Yes. And it layers to that. Thank you so much, John. That was brilliant. And that was such a complicated case. I would have just said abort. <laughs> uh, of all to you. Thank you, John, for that. We'll be back, John. Uh, some questions for you. So sure. I think... Uh, we have two more talks to go since David has uh, just sent us his presentation. We'll first take uh, Dr. Ahudas here, who again is uh, one of the most renowned uh, surgeons internationally. And we've been seeing amazing uh, stuff from him. And uh, uh, today he's going to talk to us about initial clinical experience with the second generation of the capsular anchor. It looks uh, really amazing. And let's see how it goes. Well, thank you very much. And uh, greetings from Israel. And, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Gaurav and Ashwin, for the invitation to uh, participate in this very interesting, excellent uh, uh, symposium. And uh, I would like to share with you our clinical uh, experience, initial clinical experience with the second generation of the capsula anchor. These are my disclosures, and the first one is the one that, which is relevant. Now, the capsula anchor, we designed this uh, uh, capsula clip about uh, 16 years ago, and this was designed to reposition a subluxated lens. We started with fixation of a crystalline lens, but we also showed and presented that we can reposition also subluxated posterior chamber lens, which uh, are, were malpositioned many years after the initial implantation. So here's an example of the first generation. We can see a, a patient with a traumatic cataract on the left, and then uh, after a position and situation of the lens with the anchor on the right. And we have tens of such case, cases and it works really very nicely and very effective. And in eyes with very large zonal adhesions, one can use two and potentially even three of the anchors. And this is an example of an eye with a posterior chamber lens, which was uh, uh, subluxated and after a position with one and two anchors. But this first generation anchor, we saw that it was kind of a bulky device. It was thick and white and not very flexible. And because it is uniplanar, it was also not very easy to manipulate. So now we designed the second generation of the anchor. And as one can see here, the main change is uh, uh, this is now three dimensional. It is in two plans. So here, as we compare it to the first generation on the, on the left, we can see it is much thinner, it is more flexible, there is more space for the capsule to go in, but the main change is here, as we can see, it is uh, three-dimensional and B-planner. So here are the results of the first 10 cases, and we have uh, patients with crystalline subluxation, crystalline lens, uh, in eight patients and two with subluxation of uh, posterior chamber lenses. The main reason was uh, trauma and uh, serious foliation, also morphine and eye myopia. So this is uh, uh, what it looks like first in the laboratory and we tested it uh, on the pig eyes. We can see that it is now on two levels, two planes. And now uh, this is in the pig eye, we insert it. It goes uh, quite easily to so 2.5 millimeters. And then we just place it uh, on top of the capsule and push a little bit backwards and forward. And if we uh, bring together the two lateral prongs, then uh, we can insert it even to a 1.5 and even less uh, small incision. So this is the first clinical case. Uh, this is a patient after trauma, the lens is quite soft. And now uh, we prefer to fixate it today with a Prolin 6O with flanges with uh, the thread, the suture through the hole at the base of the anchor, create a large flange so it would not go in. And then we put in the, the, the anchor. And then as we saw uh, before, we just place it on top of the capsule and push it forward. And note that we did it in this case uh, before removal of the lens material. So it also actually stabilized the lens for the surgery. Now uh, we made a temporary flange and the lens is stable, we see how it actually uh, occupies a whole segment of the anterior capsule. Fecal certification was performed, then followed by implantation of an intraocular lens. And then after the lens is in place, we make, uh, we finalize the adjustment of the length of the suture, create a, a small flange, make sure it is in the right position. And now uh, we finalize it, the lens is stable, 
and central. This is what it looks one month post-operatively, and as we can see, the flame is well covered under the conjunctiva and the tenon. The second case is also after trauma, but it was 40 years ago. And in this case, the lens was stable enough so we could perform phacomosification and remove the lens material before implanting the anchor. After we removed the lens, we, uh, we passed the 6O Pro lens and then uh, thread it through the positioning hole at the base of the anchor, create a flange, put it in, and it's quite easy to position correctly the uh, anchor after uh, we remove the lens and the, the bag is evacuated. The two lateral prongs are located behind the capsule and the central rod is in front. In this case, the patient uh, also had uh, fixed the dilated pupil. So we uh, pulled centrally the iris and did a, a small uh, pupilloplasty. And this is what uh, our patient looked at the end of the operation. Note that the anchor is uh, secured only by one suture only. This is what the patient looks like at one month. And with uh, retroillumination, we can see the position of the anchor. It is actually supported by the capsule axis and the uh, lens equator, and it occupies the whole segment. So it provides a very stable fixation. And this is a patient with subluxated intraocular lens. Uh, first, we open up a small pocket superiorly, uh, put in the first anchor, make sure that it is in place with the two lateral prongs behind the capsule, central part is in front. And now we pull it uh, up so we can create a second uh, pocket inferiorly and put in the second anchor, making sure that it is in the correct position. And then finalize and adjust the, the tension. And we can make sure that these uh, two anchors are located indeed in place. And this is what it looks at the end of uh, uh, this operation. So this is the result of the first 10 patients. And as we can see on the right, uh, seven out of the 10 patients at the final visual acuity of uh, 2025 and uh, better, and all of them improved significantly in vision. So here's another play, uh, case of inferior subluxated piston in lens, and this is at the end of surgery, one month postoperatively, the IOL is well placed in central. And in this case, we can see on this oblique view, we can see how this anchor supports uh, the capsule axis, the equator, and the whole segment of the anterior capsule. So the bottom line, this capsular support is effective as a capsule stabilizer for both crystalline lens subluxation and IOL uh, um, dislocation. And this modification, the second generation of the anchor provides very significant uh, uh, progress and an improvement in safety and efficacy and mainly the simplicity of utilizing this device. And I thank you very much for your very kind attention. And really, it's time that we meet again in person. <laughs> Unfortunately, COVID is still here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ehud. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. And I really love this device. It's probably going, uh, going to take some time for it to come into our hands. But uh, fantastic device. And I think uh, it's going to change the way that we do subluxated cases going forward. Um, Having said that, we have our last talk today, and I know that we have uh, uh, less time because I know that there's a, a session immediately after this. So I really need to keep to time. And hence, I'm going to uh, present, I'm going to showcase the video that was sent by David Chang. Uh, unfortunately, he also had his OR day today and was not able to make it, but was kind enough to send us his presentation. So here goes. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Well, I'd like to uh, present my top five pearls for doing FACO with a crowded anterior chamber. And I have no financial interest in this topic. So we have a lot of different challenges uh, with these eyes. Uh, first of all, we have to calculate the IOL power correctly. And so often, as you know, we get a myopic surprise. Uh, we have to worry about greater endothelial cell loss, because after all, this is like doing FACO in the anterior chamber. Uh, these eyes typically have a very small pupil. 
uh, and as well, uh, a, a floppy bag. It's almost as if the bag is too big, so it's very lax and it's easy to aspirate the posterior capsule. We know there are greater risk for supracoroidal hemorrhage or effusion. And then postoperatively, we can... Somehow doesn't seem to be playing. Very lax and it's easy to aspirate the posterior capsule. We know there are greater risk for supracoroidal hemorrhage or effusion. And then postoperatively, we can even have a situation where the chamber remains uh, shallow. So pearl number one is to consider using also, in addition to your regular formula, the cane formula, which you can get at this URL, iolformula.com. This is Jack Kane from Australia, and it's free online. And I run it for cases uh, with a, a short axial length. Uh, here's his paper showing six, uh, I'm sorry, rather 10 different formulas. Uh, and most of them err on the myopic side. Everything below this line is a myopic error. And you can see that the shorter the eye gets, uh, the greater the error. And so the one formula that did the best was his formula, which uses an artificial intelligence component as well as regression analysis. And pearl number two is to always use a dispersive viscoelastic such as I've shown here to protect the cornea. But remember that you have to aspirate it above, right above such a brunescent nucleus. Otherwise, when you start sculpting, uh, you can get a clogged phaco tip with this thick viscoelastic mixing with the brunescent uh, nuclear material. Pearl number three is to use a subincisional iris retractor the minute you get any iris prolapse like this. I don't need four retractors, the pupil's still large, but the problem is if I keep inserting instruments over that iris, it's going to fray it and uh, cause further trauma. So I stop and I place a subincisional retractor through a different clear corneal stab incision so that my instruments go through the clear corneal incision and they're not rubbing against the retractor. And you can see how when I do both the FACO and later the INA that this pulls that iris down and out of the path of the instrument so we don't further traumatize it. And it's key to do this the minute uh, this happens. Of course, you could try uh, intracameral phenylephrine. Um, the next pearl is to use a CTR for the reasons that I said uh, with the floppy bag. Here's the 28.5 diopter IOL. And uh, this puts it on a stretch. And in those cases where I've had shallowing of the anterior chamber, when I've done the other eye with the CTR, uh, this seems to help uh, uh, to mitigate that. Uh, this is a paper I, that I published in 2001 with uh, four cases of extremely shallow anterior chambers where I did a vitreous tap. So I'm going three millimeters behind the limbus with the MVR blade and then doing a vitrector without infusion to just soften the eye. You take a little bit out and then that lets me deepen the chamber. So we'll show a case with a, a very dense lens, an extremely shallow chamber. Uh, and this is not the most common presentation, but occasionally you do see this. And uh, here I am in the oblique quadrant, three millimeters behind the limbus. Now I'm gonna take my MVR blade and I'm gonna aim posteriorly toward the optic nerve so that I don't uh, have any chance of hitting the lens. Here's the vitrector without infusion. It's a small gauge vitrector. And I'm just gonna remove just a little bit. You only need to take out perhaps 0.2 mLs. And I'm palpating so that I make sure I don't uh, soften the globe too much uh, in the process. I just wanna soften enough so that I can now uh, uh, fit in some more dispersive viscoelastic. These eyes not only have um, posterior synechiae, but you can see here that the uh, iris stroma is really uh, stuck uh, to the lens because the lens uh, being pushed forward in essence creates much greater contact with the mid iris stroma. 
Now you have to deal with the small pupil. So here's uh, a Malugan wing. Of course, I have to put in some dye. And I like doing phaco chop in these cases to reduce the amount of ultrasound energy. But what you can tell is I have a much better chance of success by having essentially a chamber of normal depth. And here you can see the case at the end, uh, closing with an interrupted atovicral suture for the pars plana sclerotomy. I'll show a second case, uh, similar again, but uh, you can see there's a uh, YAG iridotomy superiorly, bound the pupil, a dense lens, so, so very uh, similar. And the, these cases, it's hard because the minute you go in, you're almost right up against the iris. You're not able to deepen the chamber without making the eye really firm. So again, through a, a, a conjunctival pyridomy, I go three millimeters back. I aim toward the optic nerve. Now, you can't do this technique if it's a nanophthalmic eye because you don't know where the pars plana ends. So you have to do this when it's a, a 20 or 21 millimeter or longer eye to consider this. And again, I'm trying to take a little at a time. The uh, vitrectomy means that I'm not putting vitreous traction on. And I can be very controlled in the amount that I'm withdrawing, as opposed to, say, putting in a, a needle to try to aspirate it. And again, you have to be careful not to make the eye too soft. Uh, clearly, you avoid hitting the, the, the lens by aiming posterior. And then now uh, a welcome sight that I can deepen the chamber and then do whatever technique is best, closing with the sclerotomy. Uh, so uh, be aware again if it's too short of an eye. So hopefully uh, these uh, tips are uh, of uh, value. Uh, remember to uh, use the cane formula to uh, use a dispersive viscoelastic, frequently refill the eye with this. Manage the small pupil. Don't try to be a hero with that. Uh, be aware that the bag is easier to aspirate and consider a CTR. Uh, you can do an extra cap uh, in these cases with uh, because you're trying to protect the endothelium. But again, uh, they do have a greater risk of supracortical hemorrhage in a, in a fusion. And that CTR, I think, helps to maintain a normal chamber depth, po depth postoperatively. Thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for that. We're now, uh, I think, three minutes out. Uh, or two minutes out. Gaurav, you're muted. Uh, I think Boris, Boris is here, I think. Uh, Boris, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm you want back. Do you want to try connecting your thing? We have just two, three minutes left, but we'll take you on immediately. Yes. I will uh, try to show you just one sure. three minutes about how uh, to manage this uh, small pupil case, and I hope I will be successful with that. And here is the point uh, that you made by Mark, and uh, because of the uh, pupil because constricting during the city, so there was no way to um, to manage that case other than expand the issue here when you expand the pupil with the uh, pupil expansion device uh, actually is open, so you have to be careful because you actually have the cataractic edge, and uh, that may cause uh, difficulties for on during the procedure. Now, um, I think we lost him. Oh, we lost him. We lost him. Yeah. Yeah, so, his video was not playing as well. Yeah, it wasn't really and playing. Yeah. It wasn't. Uh, yeah. So, John, why would you prefer smile uh, when doing these really small eyes now? Yes. Yes, I, <laughs> I was going to conclude because... I was itching to ask you they, that. Yeah, yeah we, we do have a Visumex and it's a much smaller uh, 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 in much smaller cone. And uh, even making a flat, you know, putting the cone in the small eye, we've not had to do any uh, cancerotomy at all. So, I think actually... Um, uh, you know, if you have a Visumax, then use that to make the cut, you know, flap cut or smile. And uh, smile now is really quite impressive, you know, getting probably as much 2020, 2015 as basic.
Yeah. Right? So I was thinking yeah. the whole time I was struggling there, John, just like I, I, my Visumax could do this like slam dunk. So, or yeah. quickly convert to PRK, but uh, that's you know, right. Yeah. 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 Yes. We have bodies really back. Just for, just for people who, who, you know, don't have Visumax, they still use the intralade. So it could be an option. Uh, the nice thing is you don't make the side cut. You really haven't damaged the eye at all. It's just a lamella cut. So, you know, and then you could just go ahead and do LASIK and maybe wait for the bubbles to go away a little bit. So it's still safe. I mean, if you cut, don't make the side cut. There's no 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 harm done, really. I'd like to know from uh, from the other speakers and Rohit uh, and Dr. Lahane as well. Uh, Ehud showed a really, really nice case of uh, bag instability and how he's managing with it with his uh, new hook. Uh, what what is it with his new anchor? What is it that you guys use in your OR? A quick one minute response would be nice because of time. That's all. MST retractors. MST retractors. Tempor MST temporarily and then the capsule tension segment long term. Right, got it. Uh, Rohit, what do you use? Uh, you're you're in mute. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm using uh, capsular hooks. Uh, during the for the stability and uh, CTR with CTS, single or double. Okay, okay. got it. Got it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chi, Dr. Lahane. What do you use for these? Same, the same. CTR, CTS, capsule back hooks to support. Yes, the same. We are also using the CTR and hooks capsule hooks. Uh, John and Gaurav, what, what do you guys? Yeah, yeah. I, I do the same. Yeah. I think we all uh, do the same and I would love to have my hands on the new S mm -hmm. anchor. I mean, you know, we'd love to try that as well. You know, it's great to great. bring the new things and sometimes, you know, they work better than what you've been using. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I use the paperclip hook, which is by Susan, but I think this is almost on the same line and I think they have the same principally, they, they do the exact same thing in, in many different ways, I'm sure, but, mm -hmm. uh, but beautiful device and happy to have that. I think yes. we've run out of time, uh, Ashwin. Yeah, we do uh, have, yeah. have, we'll yeah. have to close the yeah. I think the next session has to start. And, uh, you know, as we should thank all the speakers on behalf of AIOS. We don't have the AIOS functionaries here, but me and Ashwin to thank all of you for taking out time and bearing with us and being with us throughout this program. Uh, Lahane, sir, uh, Rohit, also from uh, India and all the international speakers. Ashwin, would you like to thank everyone? Absolutely. I mean, uh, words cannot explain it, but a uh, deep thank you to everybody because they've been up from 5 a.m. and I'm sure that in Singapore, it's already 11 or uh, odd o'clock. So I'm thinking it's 24-hour session. It's 24-hour webinars going on. <laughs> all the time. So thank you so much for being here. It's, it's a deep, deep honor for me to you know have you guys on board. Uh, over to you, Padam, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so everyone. Thank it's you. been a great Thanks, pleasure. Everyone. Thank you, Ashwin. Thank, thank you, Gaurav. Bye. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you, Lani, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chi. And also thanking our panelists and moderator for the valuable time and putting this amazing session for all of us. Thank you.